So I want to start by talking to you a little bit today about the evolving role of the WordPress administrator. Um, I'm going to be on this slide, this first one here, just for a moment, because I, I want to give an introduction. Uh, I think it's really important and helps kind of set the context of why this is an impactful idea and how it can help you. Um, and I think it's also helpful just to center ourselves in kind of the reality we're living in right now. Um, right now, it can feel like a lot is happening to us and that the individual actions that we're able to take aren't necessarily making a huge difference. There's, there's a lot of change happening in the world around us, and it's easy to feel out of control of the most important things that happen to us in our, in our lives. And so that can play out in a number of ways, even all the way down to you know, the elections that we're a part of and the way that we're able to make some decisions about who makes decisions for us. And yet at the end of the day, we experience this feeling of having other people make life and death decisions for us. Um, and, and that can make us feel out of control a, a lot. And I think it's important to feel that. I think it's important to acknowledge that that's true and that that's happening. Um, it, it is true that the people that we elect in America, for instance, are, are making choices for us that impact us in really serious ways. We should feel the consequences of the way in democracy, but also the way that we, we participate in things in our lives in general, the way that we choose to take action. But I want to hone in on something in particular about healing and about the impact that we can have as individuals, because we're seeing at the same time that it can feel out of control and that things are happening to us and that we may not have a sense of control. We can also see that individually and collectively, we do have power but we have to identify the ways that we can use that power and get good at leveraging it. For instance, you know, everyone certainly is talking about uh, the COVID situation, but I, I want to point out that as many things in the situation that, that cause us to feel powerless that might exist, we have also done some things individually and collectively that are making a huge difference, right? Like individually, those of us who are choosing to stay six feet away from other people in the name of safety, um, to choose to stay inside, even though it can hurt us financially and physically and mentally and spiritually. Um, those of us who are choosing to wear masks when we do go out to protect other people, especially the vulnerable, those of us who are thinking deeply about the people that we interact with and being honest about uh, exposure and testing and all these sorts of things, right? So we're individually making these decisions. And then as we added up those individual decisions for the folks who did participate and continue to participate in that, myself included, those actions do have an impact, right? We, we all learned the term flatten the curve earlier this year. Uh, and in fact, in a sense, we did do that. We did collectively use our individual actions to get people back out of the ICU so that hospitals could handle the flows of people coming in, right? So we together, through our collective action, did save lives by doing that. And I want to bring that up because it's really important to be able to recognize the difference between the sensation of things happening to us when we can't control them and the reality that some of those things are not able to be changed, but some can be changed if we assert ourselves, again, individually and collectively. Understanding the difference between the sensation of having things happen to us and the reality that we can impact certain aspects is, is pretty huge and helps us concentrate our efforts, focus our resolves, and ultimately strengthen a muscle of collective action for ourselves. And, you know, you, you might be like, okay, thank you for the rant. Um, I came to talk about WordPress. Well, we are talking about WordPress and it does not rise to the same level of importance as trusting science to keep us from harming ourselves and others or the truth that black lives matter. But I want you to see how flexing this individual and collective action muscle can in fact help you respond better to decisions that seem beyond your control and oftentimes actually are beyond your control. And this can help you serve your clients better and help you serve your community better as well. So there's a long-standing pattern in the WordPress space that has really accelerated over the last few years that's really causing me to want to talk to more people about this idea of WordPress administration. 
And that pattern is that the community is decisively not the decision maker for new parts of the WordPress project. And a lot of times it can feel like changes in WordPress are happening to you, especially if you're making your living off of it, and that you have little, little or no control over the outcomes. And these huge, incredibly impactful changes are showing up in regular releases with no real warning. Uh, oftentimes these are happening right before the release comes out, or at the very least, unless you're heavily involved in learning about the release ahead of time, you may not even be aware it's there. And the thing is, that sensation, like I mentioned, of things happening to us, I, I think I'm not alone, and I know that I'm not alone, in feeling like that's happening to those of us who have really gone bat for WordPress over the last decade, probably, both the project as a philosophy and the code base of WordPress itself. We've told clients to believe in the ideology behind WordPress, that we can trust it, that new changes won't just happen to you overnight because WordPress has a philosophy of backwards compatibility. And we've believed it as members of the WordPress community, and we've told clients to believe in that. And we have leveraged our trusted relationships to prop up this idea behind WordPress and this philosophy. And yet the reality is these huge changes are happening to us and therefore are happening to clients. Big, important changes and shifts to the way that WordPress works are just showing up in releases, and they're showing up for people who did not opt into them. And this is especially evident, I think, with the Gutenberg project, in which, by any definition, the WordPress community wanted to slow the roll of this new idea showing up for existing users. There were countless objective reasons to do that and to slow things down and be more methodical. And yet, the block editor has brought deep and consequential changes to long-standing workflows that people have already gotten used to every day, day in and day out for years. WordPress and its workflows, the things that you're clicking to do the most common things were muscle memory for people based on a decade of experience. Even when we updated the styling of the admin area, it still pretty much worked the same as it did before. And yet the block editor shows up and changes that. And so these big changes like that, that affect our clients are shipping by default, essentially without the consent of the community. Um, you know, despite myself and countless other people I've talked to over the years uh, who are investing in WordPress saying, this goes against the principle of backwards compatibility, which is why I stood up for WordPress. We, we believed in that philosophy and we trusted it. So. I want you to look at this a little bit differently because we have to upgrade because of the backwards compatibility philosophy. We were able to say staying up to date is always the right thing to do no matter what. It'll always work and it'll never break anything because we have this philosophy of backwards compatibility. But that is not the case anymore. Full stop. Experiences also need a sense of backwards compatibility for this philosophy to work and for WordPress to be trusted and for your clients to trust you at the end of the day for trusting WordPress. And at the end of the day now, experiences are not backwards compatible when big shifts are happening for existing users in basic WordPress changes and upgrades and versions. And so as these major and consequential changes roll out, they're being treated as opt-out instead of opt-in for existing users, which would be the proper way to roll things out. Backwards compatibility from an experience perspective means not changing something unless the user consents to it. And we have opt-in mechanisms to let users consent to things like that in a very clear and deliberate way. And then there are some other ways to look at how we can navigate these basic changes that might not have those mechanisms for opting in. But one of the reasons I want to bring up this larger idea of experiences being backwards compatible or not and WordPress administration is because I have the unique opportunity to have been and continue to be a part of the WordPress community while having a day job working for one of the largest enterprise software companies in the world. Part of my job is helping to ensure that user workflows do not change because these workflows power the businesses of the largest companies in the world. Millions and millions of people rely on software that we ship updates to 
And we do this very thoughtfully because we intentionally use the rollout of our software to gain trust with customers by never changing the workflow. And we do this for a number of reasons. Uh, and the only exceptions that we could ever really have for pushing a change to a workflow is if we have validated directly with real users that we're improving something, that we're only making the workflow better, that it will not only be intuitive, but that it will actually help people in their existing processes. Users are able to see and understand that value immediately. That's part of the testing and the work that we do to ensure that we roll things out appropriately. And so we would never do what the WordPress pr project has started to do more and more. We value our existing users way too much to push new and unexpected changes on their existing workflows. And so in this reality where this is happening more and more with WordPress now, your clients need expertise and nuance to guide the rollout of new features and changes. Upgrading by default may be safe for their code base, but it's not safe for their work. It's not safe for their job. And so the WordPress project itself clearly will not defend the end user's experience. They have different goals. Making the block editor opt out instead of opt in indicates to us that existing productive users are not the target audience for new features. I think that we should take that ideology at face value, including uh, the fact that uh, independent decisions are being made in contrast to community feedback. The basic organization and communication that, oh, if we ship this new thing in a new version, it's going to hurt my clients. That, that feedback, that consensus is not impacting what's happening in the WordPress project. And so we need to accept it and respond to it. The way that we can do what I hope to convince you of today is by shifting from being more or less a WordPress consultant or a WordPress designer, or someone who assembles WordPress projects, and begin to look for opportunities to invest in WordPress administration. So we're going to talk a lot about what this looks like and how this can break down in the WordPress space. And I hope that by the end of it, you're feeling actually really positive about the opportunities in front of you, not only to be better at your job, but to be able to help your clients and your future clients to manage their business that's powered by WordPress. So I mentioned earlier how we roll out updates to enterprise software in my day job. And even with all the protections to avoid changing a user's workflow, we still provide a mechanism for administrators to own their end user's experience by allowing them to decide when impactful changes are going to roll out. So when we necessarily have to change something about a user's workflow or about their security or about an application platform, we provide a mechanism for administrators to decide when that will work for their business and for their clients. Because for a number of reasons, they may have customized the platform to suit their business. They may have built on top of the code base that's there, expecting to build on the way that the platform itself works, the existing workflows. All of those combine into what people use to develop their own applications and concepts. And so pushing down changes may cause breakage in totally unexpected ways, even if you know someone has used all of the best practices we've provided. And so that's why we create this buffer space in between. We provide these opportunities for administrators to decide when to roll this out. So I want to keep applying this to the WordPress space, right? Because this should be more similar when it comes to WordPress and major updates. You may be an expert in helping clients assemble projects or writing great code or recommending themes and plugins, recommending hosts, talking about managed hosting, all of that stuff. But I want to encourage you to begin looking for opportunities to be that buffer in between the WordPress project and your clients, because many of them need you there, whether they know it or not. Managed hosting is an awesome thing that's evolved in the last five years, and it is not a replacement for this. It's just a really awesome tool in your tool belt. So I want to start breaking down what this looks like really specifically. Uh, it means, first of all, for the clients that you serve, your role is to be aware of and to absorb some change and then to dispense it to your clients in a more sensible way. It means thinking more than you used to 
about the implications of each major version of WordPress, new updates to themes and plugins, and deciding how to best manage and present those changes to your clients. So let's break this down. What does administering WordPress mean? It means evaluating core features ahead of time. Some of you already do this, but I want to bring more people on board with this because it's relatively inconsequential for someone that's fully new to WordPress to just experience whatever the latest version is. For better or worse, that's just the way that it is. That's the way that they will learn to work with their website CMS. They have an established muscle memory with workflows that keep their business running. And so what we're talking about here is existing users, the gigantic portion of the web that's using WordPress already to power their personal website, their business, their nonprofit organization, anything, right? We built up a quarter or a third of the web or whatever, and now WordPress is changing the way that things work for that quarter or a third of the web. See, existing users are not spending their time reading make.wordpress.org and preparing for changes because of the post that may be there. Your clients are not engaging in community discussion, trying to push back on poor decisions. It's not their job to do that. And honestly, uh, or personally, I guess, I wouldn't wish that type of infuriating gaslighting on them anyway. Uh, it's a real pain to try to be involved in community feedback, especially when you're the best interest of your existing clients differs from where the WordPress project itself wants to go. And yet what an administrator does in this scenario and in others is you deal with this as an expert. You predict the impact of these changes on your end users and you begin deciding ahead of time what the rollout should look like based on what's going to ship in those next versions. And as a reminder, these decisions, these things that change user workflows are often happening at the last minute with basically no input, even if you are following all the discussions on make.wordpress.org, right? And so as these opt-out changes come into view, I wish you could see my camera so you could see how many times I'm using finger quotes around opt-out. Um, but as these changes start to come into view, you get to start deciding whether this will benefit your clients or get in the way. You get to start evaluating changes and figuring out how or if it actually will benefit the people that pay you money and that trust you to roll out a trusted experience to them. If the changes will benefit them, then you can prepare and communicate that, right? You can decide in advance, hey, these new features are coming. I want to make you aware of them. They shouldn't interrupt your day to day, but I want you to know about them so that you can use them if it helps. On the other hand, if these changes won't help your clients, you have to find the best way to mitigate it. This is all about evaluating those core features. And so I wanna give some examples. So there are good changes that come out that could be big, but that you can see, understand, and just communicate because they're okay. They won't interrupt anything. There are good ones. There are very, very bad ones. And I'll give an example. And then there are some that just need thought for your specific use case. So let's talk about some good core features that got shipped that maybe don't require a bunch of preparation or mitigation from you as a WordPress administrator. For instance, the new site health dashboard that came out recently is so rad. It's great work. It's beautifully designed. It's easy to understand, but critically, it stands apart from other features. It doesn't change anything that people are already doing. It's as a new opportunity to learn more about your site, to do more testing, to understand new opportunities to improve your site. And so it, it's not getting in your way. And so that's an example of a great feature that you can just roll out immediately, right? That's not going to harm anyone. And in fact, is only going to give further information. You know, if you have more nuance that you want to get into about, well, maybe certain users shouldn't be able to see it, then that's fine. But at the end of the day, it doesn't provide a mechanism to ruin anybody's workflow. Another great example of a good change that got pushed down are changes to the file editor, which used to just be this like hellhole of possibility where you could take your entire site offline and lock yourself out because you forgot a semicolon. So the changes that are in there now, rules, they're so great. They prevent you from doing this problem. They make it more obvious what you are doing. They give you this little prompt to help you understand what's happening before you start editing those files. I was glad to be a part of that conversation while those things were being decided 
uh, over on the WordPress side before they got shipped. This is awesome. It'll only prevent damage. It does not change your existing experience. And even though that doesn't make editing files that way the ideal by any stretch, hopefully you can see why it's a safe feature to roll out. This is something your clients can just absorb immediately. Now, let's be honest, some getting shipped are trash for existing users, okay? Administering WordPress means absorbing some of the disruption that's coming downstream. Big new features should have been rolled out differently in recent versions of WordPress, but listen, that's not going to happen. We see over and over again that the existing user's experience is not valued over the new user's experience when it comes to upgrading WordPress. So this is an opportunity for you to absorb disruption for your clients. So let's take one example of something that should have been opt-in but wasn't and that you as a WordPress administrator can absorb the disruption of on behalf of your clients. Word 4, shipped full screen by default. I make my living being a professional experienced designer for enterprise products for the world's logies for saying this was a trash decision that violates virtually every usability principle I'm aware of. This is junior designer stuff to have shipped out a new default experience that people aren't opting into. Think about being a less technical person than you probably are. You are in WordPress in your website, clicking the same links and the same buttons that you always have. Now you've been presented with a totally different experience following the same workflow just because you upgraded your WordPress version, which is what you're supposed to be doing, right? This is what we encourage people to do. And yet you land on a page like this, which has removed all of the navigational context that's necessary to be able to use your website like you did yesterday before you upgraded. And just to make sure we're super clear, you should not expect this behavior to change. You should not think of this as an exception despite it being obviously the wrong decision. The top results in Google are all about turning this thing off. You can even at wordpress.org how this decision was made, how people expressed concern about it, and how that concern was summarily ignored and overridden by pushing out this change anyway. WordPress didn't even ship a really helpful mechanism for opting out. Even the opt-out mechanism it was not great and doesn't actually work the way that it should have. This change should have been opt-in to begin with, but it didn't happen that way. And so this, this is an example of something that you can prevent as an administrator of WordPress. And in fact, your responsibility to stand between the WordPress project and your clients to ensure that they can get their jobs done without disruption. You want to absorb that change so the clients can keep doing what they day. Now, some features just require preparation, as I've mentioned, okay? They might not be inherently good, where you can ship them out by default. They might not be inherently bad. Some just need thinking based on or, in, or are managing a website for someone else. So to put it concisely here, being an administrator of WordPress means reading the change logs. So net positive, but does require some administration type thinking. The changes in WordPress 5.3, the way that media files work, required coordination and thought. It affects the way that media is uploaded and processed, but those changes are transparent to the end users. These changes were much needed, well documented, well discussed, um, led by great people, like everything about it did, but it could have hidden cut consequences on any customizations you may have written uh, or plugins that you were already using. So for me, um, I use Delicious Brains products on a ton of my sites, and they're a great example of someone who basically filled in the gaps for WordPress administration because they were on top of this change. They proactively communicated what it was going to mean for customers of their products, and that enabled me to think about then how that would impact my clients that I help. If they had not done that, I might not have even been aware of what would have eventually caused cascading failures for media across a ton of sites just because WordPress got updated. And then inherently, because this is another user experience principle that you get really familiar with when you work in the space, 
the initial default reaction of people when something breaks is to think that they did something wrong. They take a ding to their own confidence because they assume that they're doing something wrong if it doesn't work all of a sudden. Even though there are some angry people who are quick to blame, I think you'll see this for the most part if you've worked in support and things like that. You'll see that people say, I must be doing something wrong or what did I do to cause this? And so it creates this lack of trust across the board when what you really need with your clients is a lot of trust. And so that's some of the ways that you can deal with WordPress core. But I also want you to think about some other ways of being a WordPress administrator when it comes to plugins and themes and how basically reading the change logs enables you to be helpful to your clients. Plugins often, or at least sometimes, adhere to semantic versioning, which means usually we can tell that a major version is coming out and we can see that a major version because of the principles of semantic versioning may break existing customizations or tweaks to the plugin, right? Now, WordPress itself, core, is kind of infamously not adhering to semantic versioning. That's why we can go from version 4.9 to 5.0, and it doesn't actually mean anything different than 5.0 to 5.1. Now, what that means is, at the very least, because most plugins, or many of them, do adhere to semantic versioning, we can ask plugin authors to take this seriously, and you can take it seriously, too. So when you see a major version of a plugin, you should evaluate it in a sandbox type environment before rolling it out to your clients. You should be able to assume that minor versions are generally safe. So if a plugin author breaks the trust of shipping a minor or a patch version by shoving in big changes or messing up the rollout or shipping a big bug or deprecating an API, it's time to do one of two things. First of all, you can consider finding a new, more reliable source for your plugin functionality. Um, I, I do want to encourage you to do that if reliably you're seeing that you have to spend more and more time absorbing change from a particular plugin or author. But at the very least, and something I've had some success doing personally, is you can hold plugin authors accountable by giving them direct feedback, kindly but directly, and encouraging them not to ship breaking changes in minor versions, period. Do not remove APIs, hooks, filters. Do not change major ways about how you can integrate or customize a plugin in a minor or patch version of the plugin. Make a major version upgrade so that people can understand, I see now that an upgrade has come down the pipe. It's a major version. I need to test this out in a totally different environment before I roll it out because it indicates to me that it has big changes that might change the way my customization works. Now, when we talk about themes, we are now entering the total wild, wild west because it's sort of even worse than not using semantic versioning and it's worse than the fact that WordPress just doesn't use semantic versioning. So at least you know not to expect it there. Themes seem to have absolutely no consistency in my experience with version numbers. They're almost completely irrelevant in a lot of cases. I've seen minor child theme updates, which include security and maintenance upgrades, completely change or break the foundational styling of the theme that's being used. And that's from very reputable theme authors, okay? Uh, evaluating an update for a theme especially requires literally reading the change log. Like nothing else will save you when it comes to theme upgrades. And so oftentimes you're gonna have to go through and parse whether you need to absorb the maintenance and security changes that are coming through and what you're gonna have to do to maybe counteract any additional changes that have been brought in that you don't want. So we've talked about managing core upgrades. We've talked about managing plugins and themes, how versioning might come into play, how reading the change logs come into play, and how staying involved in the community, especially for core updates, has all been a part of how you can help absorb this disruption and change for your clients. But it doesn't just have to be this kind of defensive stance when we talk about WordPress administration, it doesn't have to just be change management. Once you have your sea legs, for lack of a better term, you can go about making the experience better than the default WordPress. Administering WordPress can mean building confidence, experience of WordPress to your individual client's needs. To me, this becomes the superpower of really administering WordPress. It's not just being a consultant and saying, oh, you shouldn't do that, or you can ignore that but actually saying, no, I want to own this experience 
for my client. I want to tailor it for them and help them get their jobs done. Now, what's cool about this and does speak to WordPress being generally backwards compatible from a code perspective, I first made a presentation about doing this type of thing back in 2015. It was called Friendly, Friendlier, Safer WordPress Admin Areas. And the thing is, most of the examples that are in there about move and hide unnecessary and dangerous things still work today. That's really awesome. Um, you can remove things that don't help people, and you can also remove dangerous features. Now, at the time, I wanted to communicate the dangerous features were, for instance, the file editor. That's less concerning now because editing there is safer. But still, some other examples of what you might be thinking of when it comes to dangerous is, do you really want to surface to your client on a production website the ability to block robots from reading your website, right? Like, I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally left that checked for a few minutes after making transitions. So that's an example of something that you can go to look into using hooks and filters to hide or at least de-emphasize things that are not going to help. But what you can do is set your goal as making your client feel confident no matter where they are in the interface. Set yourself the goal of breaking this site should be impossible for my client. And I say that as someone who has done that before in the sense that it's not actually impossible, but you can make a lot of headway by getting there. So you can do this by doing an audit of the features that are available in the admin area and really considering what your users need access to in order to get their job done. One thing that I like to recommend to people to at least consider is being more hands-on about the management of uh, installing and deactivating plugins. You may consider, for instance, disabling the ability to add new plugins. You can think for your client, if you know their experience well, what do they need access to and what don't they need access to? By my, my experience, it's often easier to start with this kind of secure by default mentality and then open it up based on client feedback. Because when you have a trusted relationship, you can be honest with them. You're an expert. This is what you recommend. You can say something like, and I have before, hey, listen, we actually disable the add new plugins link by default because we want to make sure that we can manage all of the code on your website and fully support it. Um, and we have some experience that enables us to evaluate plugin before it gets added so that we can avoid trouble. I found that people are more, more open to this than it seems like. You can also, again, using hooks and filters, do simple things like removing a disable link from a specific plugin or for, from a group of them in the plugin listing. And you can also easily just hide them from the plugin listing period so that when a customer goes to look at their existing plugins, they don't have the option to see like a caching plugin or a security plugin. If it's not helpful for them to see it and they don't need to deactivate it, get rid of it so that they can't. This helps everyone to feel safer and more confident. Now you can push even further and try to really keep optimizing for that focus. You can use hooks and filters and even some custom CSS to hide distracting items that might not be dangerous, but at the end of the day, aren't really helping. Let me give a for instance from a plugin that I actually love. Yoast SEO shipped an upgrade one time uh, that added a notification center to the top admin bar. And they included these little red notification bubbles for when there was something to, you know, to go check out in the Yoast SEO area. I didn't like it. It confused a ton of my clients. They thought something was wrong with their SEO because of what the color red communicates in that context, right? And so I actually go in and I use CSS to hide that bubble in most cases because I'm able to help people manage that a little bit better. And we can find other ways of detecting major SEO issues that don't distract people. Another example might be many plugins and themes these days use the admin area as their personal advertising playground. I love, I genuinely love going in and figuring out how to disable all of this stuff when people ship it. Because oftentimes, one, you're managing licensing for your clients. So they actually don't need constant nags to upgrade to something else. Um, and oftentimes plugins don't accommodate for this pretty common scenario, actually. And so you can clean up the entire admin area for clients, keep them focused on what matters, and not distract them with tons of prompts to do reviews and upgrades and downloads and recommended plugin stuff. And so that's where you can really optimize for focus by thinking deeply about what people need to get done on your website. Now, speaking of plugins and licensing, I think it's important to think deeply about supports and licenses and how this works for clients. 
I want you to consider an idea of supporting all of the code on your website. I've actually seen a company or two start to do this recently, and I'm, I'm very encouraged by it. So let's give it for instance, okay? Think about how going to a plugin author generally works when you say that there is an issue. You're having a problem. You're having a bug. What's the first thing they ask you to do? Well, if you don't mind, just disable everything that makes your website function and look correctly, and then try it again and let us know if that still works for you. Basically, just like break the heck out of your website so that we can find out whether the problem is with our plugin or whether we can blame somebody else. And that's reasonable from a plugin author perspective, but that is not reasonable from a client perspective because they don't understand the difference most times between production and live and the staging environment where you might be able to do this kind of thing. And so I recommend often that you as an expert or as a WordPress administrator in this context, actually say, you know what, client, if you have any questions about anything that's happening on your website, come to me and I will be happy to get your question answered for you. And so what you can do on their behalf is you can go through the debugging process so that they don't have to learn what a staging environment is. You can ask the support questions from the plugin developer so that it can be better framed and you can have a more effective conversation. People who aren't technical don't know what words to use to communicate what's happening on their website, but oftentimes you do. Oftentimes you have an existing relationship with the plugin developers. And so you can kind of skip all the pleasantries of, you know, why don't you unplug your router and plug it back in to see if your internet works again, right? And so you can really help folks um, by collecting that support and then getting questions answered on their behalf. It, it sounds like extra work to some people, but in my experience, it often leads to less work because you're making entire processes more efficient and effective. And just to tack on to this, an additional thing that you can do, we've talked about using hooks and filters uh, to change the way that plugins present themselves on the back end. You can hijack the, the links array um, to filter out certain links in specific plugins that are showing up in the list. Oftentimes plugins add a support link there. You can just remove it so that clients don't get confused and try to create support tickets when you might have a different licensing situation or when it might be better for you to just manage the process of getting questions answered. Finally, this means personal growth for you. And I, I really wanna leave on this point because I think that this is an emerging concept. And that's one of the reasons I was really happy because I think a lot of you I can't see any of you right now uh, and you can't see me because my camera is off uh, at the moment. But like, I, I am so inspired and to have met so many of you in the WordPress community. You are passionate, you're knowledgeable, and you've stood up for principles like democratizing publishing and backwards compatibility. You are in exactly the right place to leverage this idea of WordPress administration for your own personal growth. See, even in the last five years, like I've mentioned, it's been amazing to watch the WordPress community and the market around it grow and expand. Since, you know, uh, early on, I remember talking to a lot of people and working in the space of trying to innovate. How do we manage WordPress? Back in 2014, I started working on a service with some other folks, and it was called Word for the first time. It was a relatively new concept. And yet now, managed WordPress is totally ubiquitous. And there are some amazing things and tools that you can use. But thinking of yourself as a WordPress administrator enables you to move your skills up market and deliver the WordPress that you know and love to your own end users. It actually gives you an opportunity not only to gain a lot more expertise, but to actually make WordPress that thing that it is on the inside of our hearts, right? Where it's actually a great tool for your end users to have at their disposal to manage their business or their organization. And so as you grow and as you become a WordPress administrator, WordPress itself becomes a tool set for you to deploy. WordPress itself is not the experience anymore. The experience is what you decided in, it decided is in cohort with your clients. And so like this is a great example to tie back to why I, I kind of set things up like this to begin with, where we have this sensation of things happening to us, but we can lose track of how our individual and collective actions can do things. And so here your individual action or your collective action with your clients can effectively slow 
the rollout of disruptive experiences for your clients. It can shield them from the politics of making all these changes available for existing users. And instead, you get to say, I choose to create this experience for my users, and I will take control of it. As a WordPress administrator, you're able to grow in your own confidence and in your own skill set so that you can say, I design and I control because I care about my users more than anyone. I can be responsible and together with my clients, we can create a WordPress experience that everyone deserves. So thank you so much for giving me a chance to talk about this today. Now, I want to toss it back over to Rachel for the last few minutes that we have here. So there are a couple questions that we can go through <laughs> with a few, a few minutes left. Um, someone asked, what can we do as a okay. community to bring issues like the one you pointed out into the design process or WordPress? Maybe they meant for WordPress. I think what they're asking is what can we do as like the WordPress community? Maybe maybe that was about the section about Gutenberg and everything. Um, what can we do as a community to maybe make sure that doesn't happen again? Um, I, oh, I, I want to be clear that I'm, I'm giving my uh, perspective and experience here. Um, is because I, I don't know that there's a mechanism for the community to affect the change that we're looking to make there. Um, I, I think there was plenty of attempt out for reasons like accessibility uh, and changes to exist. And to be frank, they just didn't do very much at the end of the day to make the impact that, that we wanted to make. And so my hope that people will kind of internalize that a little bit and start to say, what can I do to shield my clients from the changes that are going to inevitably continue to happen in this direction. So I, I know that that's not a super positive answer, but it's it's the one that I think most helps us. Cool, well, we're out of time. There were a couple other questions um, and Cliff can log on to the website and answer them later. So we have to go for now, sadly, but we were really glad Cliff could join us. Thank you, Cliff.